building and then all those who are joining us uh, online, wherever you may be. We are greatly honored by your presence. We are in the Gospel of Matthew chapter 12, verse 15 through verse 21 is where we are beginning. Uh, on last Wednesday night, we started a new series entitled Be Healed. Understanding not only what the Bible says about healing and what it means to be healed, um, but how I personally, not even as a pastor, uh, but how I personally as a believer uh, process the entire subject uh, of healing. Um, on my way to church tonight, I stopped by to visit one of our members who is in the hospital uh, and in preparing to go and while I was there, my heart and mind was reflecting on where my mind would be if the roles were reversed. If I were the one in the hospital bed as opposed to them being in the hospital bed. Uh, and I think that as uh, church leaders especially, or anyone who provides care for other people, you ought to always be able to empathize as much as possible and put yourself in that person's place. And I can be honest, it will shift your direction immediately uh, when you see them in the same way uh, that you would see yourself. Uh, so I wanted to address this subject of healing and understanding uh, the Bible's perspective on healing, but then how we flesh that out, how we live that out uh, throughout our personal lives. Reverend Dr. Tony Evans, uh, who pastors in uh, a church that's referred to as the Urban Alternative, the Oak Cliff uh, Bible Fellowship, uh, was preaching some time ago, and he was talking about, uh, and you know, he's a television preacher, but he was talking about television preachers, talking about the kind, you know, who tell you that all you need to do is pray for God's supernatural healing. You'll need to worry about taking care of your health or, you know, uh, anything along those lines. If you get sick, just pray uh, and let that be the end of it. He said, uh, Dr. Evans said, the problem with that is those preachers who are telling you to behave that way, that's not what they're doing in their personal lives. They have n not only personal physicians, but he said they have secret entrances into the hospitals. So that they tell you to, to, you know, to take your hand, lay it down on a piece of paper, draw it or trace, draw it, or trace around your hand, right in the middle of the hand, all of your prayer needs, send it off to them along with your best seed offering. Uh, and they will send you either some spring water or some oil. Uh, and that's all you're supposed to do. But that's not what they are doing to the extent that they don't want to blow their cover and be seen going into a hospital. So they have private entrances uh, to get them into the hospital. I believe that's a very disingenuous way of behaving. Uh, and uh, whatever we preach to people ought to be what we are practicing uh, in our own lives. Let's pray and then we'll dive into Matthew chapter 12, verse 15 through verse 21 as we deal with this subject of healing. Uh, Lord, we are grateful that we get to spend time together with each other. We thank you for your word. We thank you for your people. Uh, we thank you for the gift of technology as well as the gift of fellowship. And we pray for your people wherever they may be. Tonight, Lord, we seek to learn more about you specifically in the area of how you bring healing and deliverance to us. We thank you in advance for supernatural revelation for all that you will reveal to us tonight. In Jesus' name, amen. amen. All right, we're in the Gospel of Matthew chapter 12. I'm reading from the Message Bible, uh, beginning in verse 15. Uh, these verses occur after Jesus has healed a man uh, with a, King James Version calls it a withered hand. Uh, the man had suffered an infirmity uh, and he was not able to use one of his hands the way 
uh, that normal or healthy people would have been able to use their hands. And the enemies of Jesus were so cold and callous uh, concerning Jesus that they were not offended by the fact that Jesus brought healing to the man, but they were offended that Jesus healed the man on what they consider to be a high and holy day. Uh, and Jesus scolded and corrected them uh, as well he uh, should have scolded uh, and corrected them. Uh, and the same scolding and correction falls on uh, each of us tonight. That sometimes we can be so caught up in the process until we don't appreciate or value the finished product. That's free right there. That's free. Uh, th there are some mothers-in-law who are accusing their daughters-in-law of working roots on their sons because the daughter-in-law can get that son to do things that mom and daddy couldn't ever get him uh, to do. Uh, and what mom and dad ought to be doing is appreciating the fact that God has brought uh, some progress uh, instead of getting caught up on the process. Learn how to be thankful uh, for what the Lord is doing. And I think that's an important uh, biblical lesson for each one of us to learn. All right, so Matthew chapter 12, beginning in verse 15, the Bible says, Jesus, knowing they were out to get him, moved on. A lot of people followed him, and he healed them all. In the verses that come uh, after that, Jesus issues a caution for them not to tell uh, anyone, uh, but the more they tried to keep quiet, the more they had uh, to shout about the goodness of the Lord. Uh, that's like that old gospel song. I said I wasn't going to tell nobody, uh, but I just couldn't keep it to myself. That's how we uh, ought to all be. We ought to all have a, a bad case of the can't help it. We just cannot help but to brag on God. The point about that verse in verse 15 that I want to raise is that every person who was sick in this uh, scenario. Every person that Jesus came in contact with, he healed them all. And here's the question that often we wrestle with in the body of Christ. We know that Jesus healed in the New Testament, and there's some who are wrestling with whether or not Jesus is still in the healing business today. Uh, and that's what we've been trying to drive home in this theme or in this new series uh, and how we are to process it or how we are to apply it uh, in our lives. Some of you are familiar with Epsom salt. Epsom salt. If you don't know anything about Epsom salt, I recommend that you uh, stop by uh, your local drugstore or Walmart uh, and go to the section where they you know, have things like ointments. Uh, and you'll learn some stuff about Epsom salt. Epsom salt is a, a unique product. Uh, if you know anything about gardening, uh, you know that you can take Epsom salt uh, and put it in your plants, and it will work like a fertilizer and help your plants to grow. There are a couple of other things I know about uh, Epsom salt from firsthand experience. Uh, one of them is if you hurt yourself. Some years ago, I, I had a, a bad cut on my finger, probably should have gone uh, and gotten stitches, didn't think about it at that time, uh, and my finger was in excruciating pain. There was an accident that occurred uh, on the job, and when I got home, still living at home at that time, and my mom said, you need to get uh, a little bowl of water, put you some Epsom salt in it, Soak your finger in that water, and it will, this is what my mom said, it will draw the soreness out. And I was in so much pain, wasn't going, going to be any debate. Mama said, do it. That's what I was going to do. Got that bowl, put that warm water in it, poured the Epsom salt in it, put my finger in, and sure enough, within a matter of moments, it had drawn all the soreness out. Another thing I can tell you about Epsom salt uh, if you backed up and can't move, <laughs> take use, and then if you don't know what backed up means, <laughs> Google that, see what you find. 
uh, take you some Epsom salt and dilute it in some water, drink as much of it as you can stand, and if that don't make you go, dial 911, because you got some... <laughs> You got some issues, uh, you know, that, that are above Epsom salts pay grade. So you, you, you got one chemical substance, yet it can work in a number of different ways. And what I want to do with this subject of healing is not only to understand it, but to understand how to apply it. How do we apply it in and through our lives. Here's the first thing we saw on last week, or the first question that we sought to answer. Uh, it was this. Uh, why has healing always been necessary? Why has it always been necessary? We learned last week that there are three parts of us, according to 1 Thessalonians chapter 5 and verse 23. We are a soul. We have a spirit. We live in a body. We are body, soul, and spirit. And we learned last week that God can heal all three parts of us because all three parts of us can get sick. Uh, we can suffer from spiritual infirmity. We can suffer from mental infirmity or infirmities that deal with the soul. Uh, and then certainly we are familiar with suffering physically. So the, the, the reasons we saw last week uh, that healing has always been necessary or healing was necessary uh, certainly in the past uh, is as it relates to sickness. We looked at it uh, in three different ways. The first thing that we saw is that sickness involves our quality of life. Sickness involves our quality of life. That means you ought to take care of yourself uh, so that you can live a qualitative life. I want to be happy all the time. I want to be a joyful person. Uh, the difference between joy and happiness is that happiness is based on what is happening. Whereas joy, I love this definition of joy. Uh, the, uh, the word joy is taken from the Greek word kara, C-H-A-R-A. It, it literally means an inward sense of spiritual well-being that cannot be touched by outward circumstances. i give that to you again. I know it's long. Uh, joy is an inward sense of spiritual well-being that cannot be touched by outward circumstances. Uh, in, here at our church, we, we have a gas Stove uh, runs on natural gas. When we did um, a building project back in 2010, 2010 is when we uh, added on um, areas of our church, and we decided to go uh, with natural gas. And one of the things for me that is fascinating about uh, natural gas is even though you may not see any flames on the burners. That doesn't mean the pilot light isn't lit. That's good right there. You may not see any, any, any flames up top, but somewhere in that system, uh, there is what we call a pilot light. Uh, and that's that little flame that's always burning. So that whenever you need the big flame, you simply turn on the gas and it connects with that little flame. That's what the joy of the Lord ought to be. Uh, the joy of the Lord means your burners may not be on, but your pilot light is still going. Uh, it is an inward sense of spiritual well-being that cannot be touched by outward circumstances. That's what I want to have down on the inside of me, the joy of the Lord that is my strength, the joy that keeps me when I don't want to be kept, uh, the joy that keeps me when the world has gotten on my nerves, and I've probably gotten on their nerves too, but the joy of the Lord is on the inside. So uh, sickness involves our quality of life, uh, on the spiritual side, the side of the soul, and the side of the body, we want to live qualitative lives. Uh, then the second thing we saw is that sickness not only involves our quality of life, but sickness involves our quantity of years. 
quantity of years. And we saw on last week that we should not only be concerned about living well, there are also great benefits in living long. Throughout the scriptures we are told we are given promises and warnings on the benefits of honoring God and how God rewards us, those of us who honor him, by giving us long days. Uh, in Ephesians uh, chapters 5 and 6, when Paul addresses the subject of family and relationships, uh, he reminds us that uh, when the Bible uh, gave us in the book of Exodus the Ten Commandments, that one of those commandments involves honoring our parents, our mothers and our fathers, that our days might be long. Uh, which means you shouldn't have a fatalistic mentality that you're hoping uh, to leave this world quickly. Uh, one day a little boy had been invited to Sunday school. He didn't go to church uh, often. Uh, and the Sunday school teacher said to the class, how many of you want to go to heaven? And all the other little kids raised their hands and he didn't raise his hand and he started pulling down the hands of other kids. And the teacher said, little boy, why are you pulling people's Hands down, don't you want to go to heaven? He said, I want to go someday, but I thought you were trying to get up a trip for the night, and I'm not ready to go uh, tonight. We ought to be looking forward. The Bible uh, talks a lot about the benefits of long days, living long, fruitful lives. So sickness involves our quality of life, but it also involves the quantity of our years. Now, one of the things that's important about living a long time is the benefit that we're able to bring to other people. Benefit we're able to bring to other people. When it comes to the quality of our years, that's how life benefits or affects us. When it comes to the quantity of our years, uh, it really deals a lot with the impact we're able to have uh, on the lives of other people. And then the third reason we saw that healing has always been necessary is because sinners need signs. Sinners need signs. And one of the ways that God has manifested the reality of who he is is through healing so that people were able to know uh, that God was a miracle working God and one of the primary miracles uh, that we have the record of him performing uh, was the miracle of healing. So that's where we began last week, uh, uh, understanding why healing has always been necessary. Here's the second thing we started to look at on last week and it is this, why is healing still necessary? I believe, Deacon Reggie, that the same God who healed yesterday is the God who healed today. Now, I, I, I do have to pose the question uh, of whether or not we are willing to go through today what others went through in years past in order to be healed. Don't complain about what you don't see God doing uh, in the 21st century if you're not willing to do the things that have been done in previous centuries. For example, the Old Testament talks about a man named Naaman. Some pronounce his name Naaman. He was stricken with a skin disease that the Bible calls leprosy. And the Bible says that a, a servant girl said to him that uh, if I could just get you to the prophet, the prophet uh, would be able to deliver you from your leprosy. Uh, and finally, they're able to connect with the prophet. And the prophet says, go down to the Jordan River and dip seven times under the waters of the Jordan uh, and your leprosy will be taken away. You know what Naaman said? Naaman said, aren't there some cleaner rivers? Because Jordan was a dirty river. And somebody must ask a question, Naaman, how bad do you want it? Do you want to be healed or not? See, he, he was the captain of the Syrian army. Uh, he had uh, soldiers who operated under him, and he was so concerned about what people would have to say 
when they see this dignitary going down. If I said, if God said to some of y'all in here tonight, go, go find the nearest ditch uh, and just go to dipping in the ditch. Some of us would say, Lord, can't we go to the pool? Why do we have to go uh, to the ditch? The question becomes, how bad do you want it? Naaman finally goes, dips in the waters of Jordan, and when he comes up, his skin is like the skin of a baby. Ooh, let me give this to you for free, and I'm getting ahead of myself. Some of us would, would say, do I have to dip all seven times? <laughs> Some of us know what it's like to go to a doctor. Doctor puts you on a medication, tells you to stay on it a certain number of days. You start feeling better after one or two days. You stop taking the medicine. Then you go back and lie to them when the symptoms come back. And say, Doc, that medicine you gave me didn't do me no good. Well, did you take it like I told you? Well, go and give me some more of it. And let's see if we can do it uh, again. Here's the first reason that healing is still necessary today. Healing is still necessary, first of all, because sickness still exists. Sicknesses still exist. Sicknesses of the mind, sicknesses of the body, sicknesses of the spirit. And I believe that if sickness is still in existence, then healing is certainly still in existence. The second thing we saw on last week, uh, not only is healing still necessary because sickness still exists, but healing is still necessary because Satan still exists. Satan still uh, ex exists. And uh, one of the things I shared with you on last week, that there is no way that God would stop moving on our behalf and allow the devil to keep moving against us. Um, no way at all uh, that the Lord is going to go on strike and still leave the devil on the clock. It is just not uh, going to happen. All right, here's the third reason we saw Oh, and, and, and keep this in mind, keep this in mind. The reason I ought to be willing to pray so fervently for the Lord to heal and deliver me and heal and deliver people. I shared with you a few moments ago, I just left the hospital before uh, coming here today, praying with one of the members of our church. And I prayed for her the way I want somebody to pray for me that the Lord uh, would perform his supernatural, miraculous healing, that he would deliver uh, in 2022, just like he did in John chapter 11 and in all of the other places in Scripture where we find his healing occurring. Uh, the third reason that I believe God is still in the healing business is because sinners still need a witness. I still believe that God is testifying to the world around us by and through what he does for us. And I'll talk more about that in a moment, uh, that the Lord is still using us to speak to other people. So the first question we sought to answer is why has healing always been necessary? Second question we sought to answer is why is healing still necessary? Now I want to say two things about healing uh, as it relates to point three uh, and then into point four. Here's point number three as we deal with this subject of healing. Uh, because again, I want to share with you not only what the Bible says about healing, but how I personally process and understand healing from a biblical perspective. So here's the third thing I want us to see. Healing requires honesty. Healing requires honesty. Which, which means sometimes the sickness that we are suffering from is self-inflicted. And before God can heal us of the sickness, we've got to be honest about what got us sick in the first place. There was a man one day who was picking oranges. He loved picking oranges, had one of those burlap bags uh, thrown over his shoulder, and he would pick oranges and toss them uh, into the bag. 
Well, uh, in this uh, orange grove, there was a lake that came right up to where the orange, orange trees were planted. Uh, and the fella, even though his bag uh, was nearly filled with oranges, he looked up and saw a branch from an orange tree hanging over the lake. And at the end of that branch were the biggest, most beautiful oranges he had ever seen. He said, I'm going to get me some of these oranges. He climbs up that tree, goes out onto that branch, goes out onto a limb, starts picking those big, beautiful oranges. Well, uh, because his uh, bag was already nearly full of oranges, when he got out to the end of the limb, the limb broke and he plummeted down into the waters beneath. He fought his way back up to the surface and said, somebody help me, and back down he went. He fought back up to the surface, said, somebody help me, and back down he went. He came back up to the third, for the third time and said, listen, if somebody doesn't help me, I'm going to drop this bag of oranges and swim out of this lake. And the problem with a whole lot of us is we are under the weight of sickness because of some foolishness we don't want to let go of. Now, I got Bible for it. I'm not making it up. I got Bible for it. It's like the little boy who got his hand caught on the inside of a vase. Uh, and his parents were trying to help him get his little hand out. They used dish soap trying uh, to lubricate it and get, get it out. That didn't work. They melted butter, tried to use that in order to get it out. Finally, his mama said to him, how do you get your hand in here in the first place? He said, I dropped a nickel inside of the vase and I reached into the vase to get the nickel and my hand got stuck. His mama said, where is the nickel now? He said, I'm still holding on to it. And it was only when he let go of the nickel that they were easily and quickly able to pull him free. And the Lord is saying some of the sicknesses, some of the dilemmas you are dealing with are because of the spiritual nickels you're still holding on to. The stuff you are not willing to be honest about and you are not willing to let go of. In James chapter 5, we'll read this tonight, James chapter 5, verse 14 uh, through verse 16, the New Testament book of James chapter 5, beginning in verse 14. Uh, James, who is believed to have been uh, the half-brother of the Lord Jesus Christ uh, is writing to Christians who have been plagued by persecution. And he gives them words of instruction, uh, especially as it relates uh, to this subject of healing. James chapter 5, verse 14 through verse 16. Here's verse 14 uh, from the Message Bible. Are you sick? Call the church leaders together to pray and anoint you with oil in the name of the master. Believing prayer will heal you and Jesus will put you on your feet. And if you've sinned, you'll be forgiven, healed inside and out. Make this your common practice. Confess your sins to each other and pray for each other so that you can live together whole and healed. The prayer of a person living right with God is something powerful to be reckoned with. Healing requires honesty. Honesty, you gotta be willing to be honest. In John's, well, let's go to Mark chapter two, the gospel of Mark chapter two. I wanna read verse one through verse four. Uh, this is a passage that always blows my mind. Uh, Mark chapter 2, verse 1 uh, through verse 4. This blows my mind for so many different reasons. Uh, here's verse 1. The Bible says, After a few days, Jesus returned to Capernaum, and word got around that he was back home. A crowd gathered jamming the entrance so no one could get in or out. He was teaching the word. They brought a paraplegic to him, carried by four 
men. So this is a man who did not have the ability uh, to walk. His legs were not functioning, and four of his friends brought him to Jesus. Here's verse 4. When they weren't able to get in because of the crowd, they removed part of the roof and lowered the paraplegic on his stretcher. Impressed by their bold belief, Jesus said to the paraplegic, Son, I forgive your sins. Now let me tell you the kind of problem uh, Brother Mac, I would have I had with this. These four friends who brought their friend to Jesus, they carried him all the way to Jesus, carried him. And when they get to the house where Jesus is, they cannot get into the house because the house is packed full of people who came to hear the word. Now, some folks would have said, you know, we tried and we failed, let's go home. They said, no, we've come too far to turn around now. They climbed up onto the roof started tearing open the roof and they made a hole big enough to let the man down in G Can you imagine being in church? We in here tonight uh, and all of a sudden ceiling starts opening up and we see body parts start dropping down uh, through the ceiling. They let the man down in Jesus's presence and I'm most certain they were expecting to hear Jesus say, be healed or they were expecting Jesus to lay his hands on the man and they wanted to see healing come out of Jesus' body and go into the man. Jesus doesn't lay a finger on the man. Jesus says, I'm going to get rid of what got you in this predicament in the first place and it is your unconfessed sin. Jesus said, your sins are forgiven. I bet those friends were looking at each other saying, sin did all of this. They were probably saying what I would have been saying, Brother Kenny, we could have fixed this at the house instead of us dragging you all the way out here to Jesus and tearing open uh, this roof. We could have fixed this at the house. Healing requires honesty. Let's go to John's Gospel, chapter 11. Gospel of John, chapter 11. This is one of the most noteworthy miracles uh, recorded uh, in the entire Bible, certainly. Uh, in the New Testament, John chapter 11. I want to read verse 1 through verse 6, and then I want to pick up in verse 14. Gospel of John chapter 11 uh, and verse 1, and I want to read verse 1 uh, through verse 6. The Bible says, A man was sick, Lazarus of Bethany, the town of Mary and her sister Martha. This was the same Mary who was who massaged the Lord's feet with aromatic oils and then wiped them with her hair. It was her brother, Lazarus, who was sick. So the sister sent word to Jesus, Master, the one you love so very much is sick. That's why I want to stay on good terms with the Lord, uh, so that whenever I need to pray, I want me and the Lord to be on good speaking terms. I'm like, Lord, it's me. Again, I know I was here this morning, uh, but I'm here all over again because I got a new problem. <laughs> Lord, I'm here at 735 because the problem I had at 635 uh, was different from the one that I have now. I don't want to get on the Lord's nerves. I don't want the Lord to look at the spiritual caller ID, see my name, and say, here he is with his trifling self. Only wants to talk to me whenever he's in trouble. No. They said to Jesus, your friend whom you love, name Lazarus, he is sick. Verse 4, when Jesus got the message, he said, this sickness is not fatal. It will become an occasion to show God's glory by glorifying God's son. That's what he says in 1 through 4. Uh, in the verses that come in between, in verse 5, uh, through verse 13, there's a whole scenario that goes on with Jesus and his disciples. I want to pick up, though, in verse 14. Uh, this is the end of Jesus' conversation with his disciples. He says to them in verse 14, Then Jesus became explicit, and he said, Lazarus died. And I am glad for your sakes that I wasn't there, 
you're about to be given new grounds for believing. Now let's go to him. That's when Thomas, the one called the twin, said to his companions, come along. We might as well die with him. They're not talking about Lazarus's death. They're talking about Jesus's death because the last time Jesus went near Bethany, which was two and a half miles outside of Jerusalem, Jesus was under the threat of death. So the disciples are saying, if Jesus is going to die, then we're going uh, to die alongside of him. Here's verse 17. When Jesus finally got there, he found Lazarus already four days dead. Bethany was near Jerusalem, only a couple of miles away. And many of the Jews were visiting Martha and Mary, sympathizing with them over their brother. Martha heard Jesus was coming and went out to meet him. Mary remained in the house. Martha said, Master, if you'd been here, my brother wouldn't have died. Even now, I know that whatever you ask God, he will give you. Jesus said, your brother will be raised up. Martha replied, I know that he will be raised up in the resurrection at the end of time. Here's Jesus' response. You don't have to wait for the end. I am right now. Resurrection and life. The one who believes in me, even though he or she dies, they will live again. And everyone who lives believing in me does not ultimately die at all. Do you believe this? That's what Jesus asked her. Do you believe this? Here's verse 27. Yes, Master. All along I have believed that you are the Messiah, the Son of God who comes into the world. After saying this, she went to her sister Mary and whispered in her ear, The teacher is here and is asking for you. The moment she heard that, she jumped up and ran out to him. Jesus had not yet entered the town, but was still at the place where Martha had met him. Don't miss that. Don't miss that. By the time Jesus gets to where Lazarus' area is, Lazarus has been dead for four days. And Jesus is still hanging out on the outskirts of town. And they send for Mary. She comes along with Martha. Here's verse 31. When her sympathizing Jewish friends saw Mary run off, they followed her, thinking she was on her way to the tomb to weep there. Mary came to where Jesus was, where Jesus was waiting and fell at his feet. Don't miss that. Jesus was waiting. Don't miss that. Jesus was waiting. So Mary came to where Jesus was waiting, fell at his feet, saying, Master, if only you had been here, my brother would not have died. When Jesus saw her sobbing and the Jews with her sobbing, a deep anger welled up within him. He said, Where did you put him? They responded, Master, come and see. Verse 35, shortest verse in the Bible, two words in King James. Now Jesus wept. The Jews said, look how deeply he loved him. Others among them said, well, if he loved him so much, why didn't he, why didn't he do something to keep him from dying? After all, he opened the eyes of a blind man. Then Jesus, the anger again welling up within him, arrived at the tomb. It was a simple cave in the hillside with a slab of stone laid against it. Jesus said, here's where I'm trying to go. Jesus said, remove the stone. The sister of the dead man, Martha, said, Master, by this time there is a stench. He's been dead four days. Jesus looked her in the eye. Here's what Jesus said. Didn't I tell you that if you believed, you would see the glory of God? Then to the others, go ahead, take away the stone. They removed the stone. Jesus raised his eyes to heaven and prayed, Father, I'm grateful that you have listened to me. 
Uh, I know you always do listen, but on account of this crowd standing here, I've spoken so that they might believe that you sent, sent me. Then he shouted, Lazarus, come out. Good thing he called Lazarus by name because he said this in the cemetery. If he hadn't called Lazarus by name, every grave in the cemetery uh, would have opened at the same time. Then he shouted, Lazarus, come out. And he came out a cadaver wrapped from head to toe and with a kerchief or napkin, King James Version says, over his face. Jesus told them, unwrap him and let him loose. Now, here's the point that I want to make. Before Jesus gave Lazarus back to them, he made them get over the fact that he took Lazarus in the first place. All Jesus had to do was show up. But when Martha met him with shame and victimization, she didn't say, hello, Reverend. She didn't say, hello, Dr. Jesus. She said, if you would have only been here, our brother would not have died. And Jesus said, your brother is going to rise again. Do you believe this? And notice that Jesus did not leave the place where he was until both Martha and Mary uh, came and consented to the fact that Jesus was going to do for them what only he could do. Hey, this part is also free. Jesus said to them, show me where you laid him. And then when they get to the tomb, Jesus says, roll away the stone. Uh, Madam First Lady, I, I had some issues with that, uh, so I called Jesus. Because, you know, we have Verizon, and we have Verizon, I got a global calling plan. I, I called Jesus. I said, uh, Reverend Jesus, I've been telling people that, that you are omnipotent. That means you have all power. We pronounce it omnipotent. Uh, you have all power. Uh, he says, yes, you are correct. I have all power. There is no power that I do not I said, all right, all right, all right. I said, Lord, I've also been telling people that you are omniscient. We pronounce it omniscient. That means you know everything there is to be known. He says, you better believe it. I am omniscient. I know all things. I said, well, Jesus. In John chapter 11, the Bible says, when you made it to Bethany, you asked them to tell you where Lazarus had been buried. He said, yeah, I did. I said, when you got to the cemetery, you said to them to roll away the stone. He said, yeah, I did. I said, well, 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 Jesus, if you can do all things and you know all things, why did they have to tell you uh, where Lazarus was buried? And why did they have to roll away the stone? Why didn't you roll it away? And why didn't you just show up to where Lazarus was? And Jesus responded. Um, he said, thought. You are right. I could have done it, but they could. <laughs> and thought, the better question is, why would you be obligating me to do something that you could do? And some of us, the reason we're not walking in healing and we're not walking in deliverance, you can drink more water. You can't go to bed on time. <laughs> you can't change. The, why are, God is wondering of us tonight. Why are we waiting on God to do supernaturally for us the things that we ought to already be in a position to do for ourselves? He said, I told them to show me where he was laid because they could. I told them to roll the stone away because they could. But the reason that I shouted, Lazarus, come forth, is because when you are willing to do what you can do, I can show up and do what you can't do. If you handle all of your cans, the Lord will handle all of your can'ts. Let that sink in tonight. Somebody ought to type that in the chat. You do the can, and he'll do the can't. You do what you can do, and he will do what only he can do. Before he gave them their brother back, he made them get over the fact 
that he took their brother in the first place. What are you getting at, Pastor Thorpe? Healing requires honesty. Healing requires honesty. Because don't... Because to, to call on God without acknowledging your wrong is disingenuous. You can't pray with a straight face and ask God to fix what you know you messed up. At least be honest about the fact that I messed up, that I made a mistake. So healing requires honesty. Here's the second, or the, the fourth point that I want to make, uh, it is this. Healing may require persistence. Healing may require persistence. All throughout scripture, we have the record of Jesus healing people uh, in a number of different ways. Uh, during Jesus' earthly ministry, there were three people that he raised from the dead. The first one was the widow's son at Nain. Uh, the second one was Jairus' daughter. And the third one was Lazarus. He healed them in different places. He healed them using different procedures. He healed them ultimately for different purposes. Uh, the one healing of those three where he raised uh, people from the dead that I want to point out uh, is when he healed the widow's son at Nain. When he heals Jairus' daughter, the reason he healed her is because her daddy came to Jesus wanting healing for his daughter. Matter of fact, she was sick at the time. She died while Jesus was on the way. So Jesus healed that young girl because her daddy came to Jesus for healing. Jesus heals Lazarus. Uh, resurrects him from the dead because Martha and Mary, Lazarus' sisters, sent word to Jesus. Yet when he heals the widow's son at Nain, the Bible says that Jesus was traveling. He saw another crowd ahead of him, and he wanted to know why the other crowd had gathered. Somebody in the second crowd passed the note to the folks in the first crowd and word got to Jesus that there was a woman on the way into the cemetery. She was a widow woman, and she was burying her only son. And Jesus said, the devil is a liar. Won't be a funeral today. And as they were carrying the body uh, into the cemetery, the Bible says Jesus laid his hand on the, the casket, uh, the item that the body was wrapped in, and, in, and life immediately became back, came back into the boy, and Jesus turned the boy back over to his mom. Here's the point that I'm making. Jairus' daughter was healed because her daddy came to Jesus. Let me say it another way. Jairus' daughter was healed because of her daddy's prayer life. Lazarus was healed because of Mary and Martha's prayer life. But... The widow's son at Nain was healed because Jesus just felt like healing. Let me share this with you for free. Sometimes in your life, Jesus will show up and bring deliverance. Ain't nobody got to pray. Some stuff he just does for his own namesake, for his own glory. But at other times, you're going to have to be a little more persistent. And the question will always exist, how badly do you Want it. In, in Matthew's Gospel, chapter 9, beginning in verse 20, uh, we find a record or an example of what it means to be persistent in our praying, persistent in our desires to see God uh, do great things. Uh, Matthew chapter 9 and verse 20, this is a very uh, noteworthy passage that is uh, made reference to quite often. Matthew chapter 9, verse 20 and verse 22. The Bible says, just then, a woman who had hemorrhaged, how long? Twelve years. Slipped in from behind and lightly touched his robe. She was thinking to herself, if I can just put a finger on his robe, I'll get well. Jesus turned, caught her at it. Then he reassured her. Courage, daughter, you took a risk of faith, 
and now you are well. The woman was well from then on. When you read this uh, in other uh, New Testament records, one of the things you learn about this woman uh, is that this sickness had lasted for 12 years and the woman had spent all of her money trying to get better and instead of her getting better, she had actually gotten worse. Have you been there? Have you been in a season when you have been trying to work things out, trying to make things better, only to find that they got worse? In Mark's Gospel, chapter 5, beginning in verse 25, the same record of this woman is recorded, uh, but we're given some further details. That's Mark, chapter 5, uh, beginning in verse 25. Uh, there you find these words. A woman who had suffered a condition of hemorrhaging for 12 years, a long succession of physicians had treated her and treated her badly, taking all her money and leaving her worse off than before. She had heard about Jesus. She slipped in from behind and touched his robe. She was thinking to herself, if I can put a finger on his robe, I can get well. The moment she did it, the flow of the blood dried up. She could feel the change and knew her plague was over and done with. Sometimes healing requires persistence. There's some things the Lord can do overnight, some stuff he ain't going to do overnight. And your question needs to be, how persistent am I willing to be in order to get the job done? Which means if the Lord is still fighting on your behalf, don't stop fighting for yourself. Sometimes you got to hang in there. Amen? Parents, that's why you got to be careful how you raise your kids. Because when doctors start talking funny, you can cough one time and your kids say, it's been a good life. We'll, you know, we'll, we'll see you on the other side. <laughs> no, no, no. I, I need some folks can hang in there with me. Because often it is said of people, uh, even in an unconscious state, that they can still hear things that are going on around them. And I don't want to be laying there and y'all having conversations about, well, you know, it's been nice. Peace out, cuz. We'll see you uh, on the other side. I want to ask a couple of questions as we come to the end of this series uh, to help drive this theme home uh, as sharply as I can. Here's the first question I want to ask. Because by this point, we know that God still heals. We know he healed yesterday. We know he can still heal today. Why? People still get sick. Satan is still real. And God is still testifying to sinners who are around us. So now that I know God wants to heal, and I know that my healing is going to require me to be honest, I need to be open and honest with God about what got me into the shape that I am in, uh, and my healing may require me to be persistent. I can't just pray one of these now I lay me down to sleep kind of prayers. Sometimes I got to eat some carpet and go to God in sincere prayer and tell him about my issue. Uh, in um, 2 Corinthians chapter 12, uh, when uh, Paul had a thorn in his flesh. The Bible says he asked God on three different occasions to remove the thorn. And finally, the Lord said, I am not going to move it. Paul is responsible for writing at least 13 books in our New Testament, 14 if we count the book of Hebrews. If Paul had to pray about something three times, why are you so upset? So, two questions I want to ask. Here's the first one. What should I obligate God to move? What should I obligate God to move? The stone of sickness, be it sickness of the spirit, sickness of the soul, sickness of the body. When do I get to the place where I conclude 
that this is a God-sized problem? Here's the answer to that question. Here's when you know it's a God-sized problem. You ought to obligate God to move that which only God can move. That which only God can move. Some of us don't need a miracle. We just need to be honest and more diligent about what it is uh, that we're doing. If you walk out of here tonight and your tire is flat, we're not going to hold a prayer meeting about your tire. I just want to be honest with you. We're not going to do that. If your battery is dead, we are not, I'm not going to get some oil to anoint your Buick with oil. We're going to get some jumper cables. Uh, and then we're going <laughs> to send you to the auto parts store to have what's called a load test done. That's going to tell you whether or not your battery is strong enough uh, to sustain a charge. It'll also tell you if your alternator is shot. These are all technical terms. What I'm getting at is sometimes you don't need a miracle. And I don't need to, I, I'm not going to sit in my house saying, God, if you don't start the car, it won't be starting. Lord said, you better call an Uber because you're going to be sitting there a long time waiting on me to do for you uh, what could what have been done under normal or other circumstances. Now, we'll look at one passage tonight because we're almost out of time and I'll uh, wrap up the rest of this Lord's willing next week. First Timothy chapter 5, because some of y'all are going to like this. I'm, I'm going to read it in uh, Bro Josh, I don't know if you could do this. I know we're in the Message Bible. I may want to read this one uh, in the King James Version uh, as well. Uh, 1 Timothy chapter 5 and verse 23. This is Paul writing to his young son in the ministry uh, named Timothy. 1 Timothy chapter 5 verse 23. And uh, what Paul has been doing with Timothy uh, is giving him instructions on how to bring and maintain order in the Christian church. Uh, and he's, he's uh, told him how to select leaders in the church, um, what characteristics and qualities those leaders are supposed to have. Now, one of the things that he has already told Timothy about leaders is that leaders can't be liquorheads. He talks about male leaders and he talks about female leaders and he says they can't be liquor heads. But then you get to verse 23. Message Bible says, and don't worry too much about what the critics will say. Go ahead and drink a little wine, for instance. It's good for your digestion, good medicine for what ails you. Somebody said, I knew it. I knew that was in the Bible. <laughs> I knew that was in the Bible. Josh, if you can pull it up in the King James uh, Version, this is the way that uh, most of us uh, are, are used to reading it. King James Version says, Drink no longer water, but use a little wine for thy stomach's sake and thine often infirmity. So here's what you understand when you put all of that together. Timothy had stomach trouble. Had a weak stomach. And as a result of his stomach issues, the water in their area was constantly affecting his stomach. Most Bible scholars believe, Sister Demps, that when the Bible speaks of Timothy's water drinking, that he was religiously only drinking water because he didn't want anyone to see him drinking anything other than water. He wasn't going to drink no diet soda. He wasn't going to drink Kool-Aid with Splenda in it. All he was drinking was water because he, he was not only trying to be good to his body, he was trying to maintain his witness and his testimony. And Paul said to him, you're going too far, bro. The water is killing you. That particular water now. Not, now, you got Zephyr Hills. Ain't no excuse now with your uh, Zephyr You tell me, I don't like the sign it. Don't buy it. Get you some Zephyr Hills or the public spring water or the Walmart brand of water. Paul said to Timothy, you stop drinking that water. And as a substitute, now little is in there. You see that? He, he ain't saying a gallon now. Use a little wine for thy stomach's sake and thine often infirmities. Okay, here's, here's the part you missed. Here's the part you missed. Paul 
Why didn't you go to Timothy and lay hands on him and heal him of the stomach trouble? Paul, why didn't you call a prayer meeting? Why aren't you anointing Timothy with oil to heal him of his stomach issues? Because Thorpe, his only problem was he was drinking bad water. And catch this. If water was the cause of his problem and Paul laid hands on him and healed him of whatever stomach trouble he was having that day, if he turned around and drank more water again, he'd have been sick all over again. And when it comes to what should I obligate God to move, I should only be obligating God to move the things that only God can move. Now the stuff you can do do it. We so funny. We so fu we funny. We Christian folks are funny. Some of us have been trained badly. We've been trained that if you can see what your problem is, fix it. If you can't see what it is, pray about it and trust God to fix it. That don't make a lot of sense. That don't make Nobody who wants their hair done or wants their hair cut sits at home saying, Father, in the name of Jesus, bring out the clippers, the curling iron, the creamy crack, that's relaxer. Bring it out, Jesus. Bring out the flat iron, whatever, the, the rods. Bring it out, Lord. Bring out the edge control, Lord. Bring it out in Jesus' name. We don't do that. You go get, imagine that. You drive by the doctor's office with a pain on your way to get your hair done. And the Lord is saying, which is more important? Where does your value system lie? And often we are obligating God to do what can be taken, of, taken care of a different way uh, if we would simply exercise some due diligence uh, and honor God with the resources that God uh, has given us. We are not in a third world country. We're not you're not sitting in your car, it's empty, out of gas, and you asking God to get you across town. No, you need a gas can. You need gas can, you need AAA, somebody to come, put gas in. Now, if I break down in the middle of nowhere, I'm praying that the Lord will help me make it on fumes. That's because I'm broke down in, oh, this is good. I got to let y'all go, but this is good. I break down in the middle of nowhere, I'm out of gas. I have the right to pray and ask God to help me get to the next phase. But I should also be honest about the fact that I ran out of gas trying to get to my favorite gas station. It's going, I'm going to be hard-pressed begging God to put gas in the tank, and I drove by five gas stations. I at least need to begin with being honest about what got me in the predicament in the first place. I could talk about this all night, but I'll wait until uh, the next time we're together. Let's stand together. We're going to pray, uh, and then we are headed home. I pray uh, that tonight and last Wednesday night uh, have already been a blessing to you. Ooh, ooh, ooh. Let, let me, ooh. Uh, yeah, okay, good. Uh, next Wednesday is uh, the Wednesday before Thanksgiving. All right, Lord's willing, uh, I'm going to be here, Lord's willing, next Wednesday before Thanksgiving because we worship in a, a different way now. We do it virtually uh, and in person. In years past, a lesson y'all taught me in years past is uh, right before holidays, y'all don't like to be in church. That's a lesson y'all taught me in years past uh, but because we do it virtually and in person. Uh, Josh, as long as you can make it, you know, all right, be it, Josh. Uh, we, we'll be able to work it out together. Hope all of you will be here. But you know why I'm going to be here? It's going to be kind of hard for you to gather around the dinner table on Thursday, call yourself thanking God for all that he has done, and you wouldn't even come to his own house or log in the night before. The Lord going to say, now, are you really thankful? Well, Lord, you know I had these pies to stir. And then you got the nerve to tell the Lord, you know, I had, had these onions to cut up, Jesus. The onions I gave you. The onions you're going to use my teeth to eat with. And then got the nerve to be up all night long on Black Friday. but couldn't come to church on, on Green Wednesday. Matter of fact, br bring your onions with you, bring your bell pepper, bring it with you, cut it up in church, apron and all, it's all good, it's all good, it's all good. We ain't gonna help you cut it up, but uh, we'll at least offer you some advice on, on what you're gonna cook the next day. 
Like if you're cooking macaroni and cheese using Kraft squares, we want to stop you right now uh, and, and tell you not to do it. Let's pray. Look forward to seeing you uh, next Wednesday night. Lord, we are grateful. We're thankful for your word, thankful for every promise that your word contains. We call on you tonight for every person that we are connected to who stands in need of your supernatural healing. We don't have to send you anywhere because you're everywhere at the same time. We pray tonight that your healing power would flow, that your deliverance would flow. You did it before. We're trusting you to do it again. Watch over us this night. Keep us. Hold us in the palm of your hand. In Jesus' name, amen. All right, let's give God a great big hand, great big hand. High five somebody in the spirit and tell them, be healed, be healed, be healed, be healed.